Our faith sees the wedding day not as the place of arrival, but the place where the adventure really begins. The pomp, the pageantry, what's not to love? The technological age has brought with it a growing fascination with the royal family. But there's nothing quite like a royal wedding that gets the nation united in feverish anticipation. Royal weddings have transformed from political and allegiance-led arrangements to genuine love matches, thanks to Queen Victoria and her romance with cousin Prince Albert. Here is the stuff of which fairy tales are made. The prince and princess on their wedding day. Diana Francis, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband so long as ye both shall live? I will. Well, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. William Arthur Philip Louis, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife to live together according to God's law in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live? I will. I will. Is it an instant yes from you? Yes. As a matter of fact, I could barely let you finish proposing. I was like, can I say yes now? She didn't even let me finish. She said, can I say yes? I can I say yes now? And then, then there was hugs, and I had the ring in my finger. And I was like, can I, can I give you the ring? She goes, oh, yes, the ring. <laughs> Walk down the aisle with us arm in arm as we peek behind the curtain at some of the greatest royal weddings in modern history. Looking at some of the time-honored traditions of pomp and ceremony to the great weight of the dress reveal and elaborate design of the all-important wedding cake. As husband and wife live out their vows, loving and cherishing one another, sharing life's splendors and miseries, achievements and setbacks, they will be transformed in the process. What about the proposal, Your Royal Highness? How did that come about? Um, well, I, uh, I asked uh, Diana before she went to Australia two, three days before. Because I thought it would be a good idea that, uh, apart from anything else, if she went to Australia, she could then think about it. And if she didn't like the idea, she could uh, say she didn't. Or if she did, she, she could say that. But in fact, you, you actually said... Yes, quite yes, promptly. <laughs> before you went to Australia? Yes. And then we had to sit on it for three weeks. A royal wedding is an extremely exciting event, not just for the family, but for the public too. The moment we hear of a proposal in the family the world is anxiously awaiting any details about the special day. It's really great. Why have you come here today? To try and get a glimpse of Diana and Charles. I think he should get engaged because he's getting older. Well, now he is engaged yeah. and he's been announced. What do you think? Oh, I think it's very nice. Wonderful. Perfect. Couldn't be better. Why, why are you so pleased? Because I think she's just the right person for him. The formal announcement of royal marriages has evolved over the Queen's reign. Her Majesty's betrothal was announced by her father, King George VI, in the court circular in 1947. Photos of the couple were taken imminently and circulated around the world. We're very busy. <laughs> not back to the nursery and not back, no. to, not, not back to flat sharing, presumably. No. Nope. You've uh, moved to your accommodation? I've been moving all over the place, I just think. Trying to keep away from us. Possibly, yes. <laughs> but you, you... It has become commonplace for royals to have their official portraits upon their engagement, but we have also been allowed a quick peek behind the curtain as the couple sit down to an interview. It is one of the few times we ever get a glimpse of what the couple might be like together and hear news about the proposal as they share thoughts about their upcoming marriage. One of the most important elements to a wedding is, of course, the wedding dress. It is now popular to wear a white wedding dress and that is no different for royals. But it has not always been tradition to wear a white gown. In fact, it was customary to wear your best dress, whatever color that may be. 
Queen Victoria set a new custom in place as she donned a white dress, but her reason was to be as visible as possible to well-wishers. Ever since, royal brides have opted for beautiful white gowns for their weddings. Queen Victoria's memory is still alive in another aspect of royal bridal wear as, on her wedding day, she did not wear a tiara, but a wreath of orange blossom. Orange Blossom has since been incorporated into the wedding attire of Queen Elizabeth, Diana, Princess of Wales, and Catherine, Duchess of Cambridge. Each royal bride has picked a unique style and marked their place in history. And now the great hour arrives as the Queen and Princess Margaret Rose leave Buckingham Palace for the ceremony at Westminster Abbey. And Prince Philip, with split-second timing, also departs for the great rendezvous. The royal standard waves over a truly royal occasion as the state coach, with Elizabeth and the King, is escorted to Westminster Abbey by the household of cavalry guards, a sovereign's escort. Pomp, pageantry, and splendor are revived for this day in austerity-ridden London. Following World War II, the then Princess Elizabeth was due to marry Prince Philip. Princess Elizabeth met Prince Philip at a family wedding, but she can't really remember that moment. The reason we know so much about it is because her governess, Marion Crawford, uh, talks in great detail about their first meeting at Dartmouth College, where Prince Philip was a, a naval cadet. And he was very, very good looking, 18 years old, very striking, blonde looking. And he was assigned to look after the two princesses, Elizabeth and Margaret, for the day, for their visit, while their parents went around the college. It's quite strange to think of an 18 year old looking after the princesses, the oldest of whom was 13. But he decided that it would be fun if they jumped the tennis nets. So he took the princesses outside and he jumped the tennis nets for them and they were very, very impressed. Later he went on board the vessel that the, the, the king and queen had come to Dartmouth in and he had lunch and then and the following day he went and had tea. So that was the meeting that the princess remembers. In the post-war austerity, famously, they saved up ration coupons for the material to make her gown. Norman Hartnell was chosen as the designer and had whitewashed his windows to try to keep the dress from the peeping eyes of the public. But media speculation was so intense that parts of the design were leaked. Nonetheless, the dress was a great success. A dress fit for a princess, made of satin with a train 15 feet long. The groom too wears something special for the big day. Most men in the royal family serve some time in the armed forces as the sovereign remains the head of the forces so very often they will wear full military dress to weddings. Prince Philip was no different and wore his naval uniform to his wedding to the Queen. Well, when uh, Elizabeth and Philip got engaged, they decided that because London was ravaged by war and you know, a, a lot of the buildings were absolutely rubble, and, and there was, you know, there was unemployment, there was rationing, it was in a really bad situation place, the government or the king thought, well, let's have a very quiet wedding at St. George's Chapel, Windsor. No point, no ceremony, we'll just, you know, be very private. But then the government surprisingly said, no, 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 we need to lift the people's spirits. Let's have a beautiful royal wedding that everybody can see. So that is what ended up happening. And it was televised and eventually the television got to America. So it, was, it became a global affair and it did lift people's spirits in London hugely. To see this beautiful young couple um, married, uh, uh, you know, no one had seen anything like that for, for the years of the war. In the advent of changing technologies, the then Princess Elizabeth's wedding was the first wedding broadcast live on radio. It was also filmed for the newsreels broadcast later that day. Princess Elizabeth had a beautiful bouquet for the ceremony, but when it came to the tradition of taking the official portraits, the bouquet had gone missing somewhere along the journey. Several days later, they dressed up in their wedding attire again, 
with another bouquet to take official photos. It is now protocol for the florist to make up two identical bouquets for the day. Princess Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh received 2,500 wedding gifts from around the world and had 12 official wedding cakes. As food rationing was still in force, ingredients were sent to the princess from overseas. In the Great Abbey of Westminster, Elizabeth married the man of her choice. The ceremonial drive reflected her happiness. For had she not declared as a young girl, when I get married, I shall make my husband as happy as mummy has made papa. Before leaving on their honeymoon, the young lovers made a picture that found a treasure in the album. Well, from Prince Philip's perspective, this is someone that had had to leave their country. They didn't have a home of their own. All his sisters were married to German aristocracy and lived in enormous castles. And there's Philip, you know, living off the goodwill of his relations. So I think that the idea of, of marrying a princess that, that was going to inherit so much must have been very attractive. And he was pushed by his uncle, Louis Mountbatten, who was the great kingmaker. And he really pushed Philip it, 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 into kind of um, maintaining a relationship with Princess Elizabeth. She was completely smitten with him from the age of 13. And I think she started right, she wrote to him to say, you know, thank you for entertaining us at Dartmouth. And I suppose she it gradually, gradually kept up. Then, of course, during, during the, uh, the time when he was on leave, on shore leave, he, he often went to stay at Windsor Castle. And that's when their relationship you know, became more serious. And eventually, eventually, um, he proposed to her at Balmoral. I think that the main lesson that we've learned is that tolerance is the one essential ingredient of any happy marriage. It may not be quite so important when things are going well, but it is absolutely vital when things get difficult. And uh, you can take it from me that the Queen has the quality of tolerance and abundance. I think many people have asked the Queen and asked Prince Philip what is the secret of, of their relationship. And the Queen has spoken out on a few occasions. And she said, patience, sense of humor, and she said famously, of course, that Prince Philip had simply been her rock and her stay over the years. And he had, he'd always been there to support her. Although he never involved himself in constitutional affairs, he was there as a sounding board. He was someone to listen and someone who would be on her side or would give her uh, criticism, which of course nobody else really could. Yesterday, I listened as Prince Philip spoke at the Guild Hall, and I then proposed our host's health. Today, the roles are reversed. All too often, I fear Prince Philip has had to listen to me speaking. Frequently, we have discussed my intended speech beforehand, and as you will imagine, his views have been expressed in a forthright manner. <laughs> He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim, or we shall ever know. The wedding of Princess Margaret to Anthony Armstrong Jones was the first royal wedding to be televised live with an audience of over 300 million. The news that the two were to marry came as a surprise to many. Up until their engagement, Margaret's relationship with Armstrong Jones, a fashion photographer, had been a well-kept secret. Although the press were obsessed with following her and identifying her likely suitors, she would visit him in secret at his studios and he would accompany her to events, but Anthony was often in the background. Anthony Armstrong Jones was considered a commoner, not considered a real prospect for Margaret, which is why their romance went undetected for so long. At the Royal Lodge at Windsor Great Park, 25 miles outside London, Princess Margaret and her fiance, Anthony Armstrong Jones, pose for the first picture record of their engagement, only a day after the surprise announcement. Mr. Jones is the court photographer, 
who has taken almost all the pictures of Britain's royalty issued in the last two years. Princess Margaret wore a lilac woolen suit and flat brown walking shoes. Speculation mounted as to the date of the nuptials, best guesses after Easter or early June. Margaret happily displayed her engagement ring, a ruby set in gold, surrounded by diamonds in the shape of a flower. The couple spent the weekend with the Queen Mother in quiet seclusion. As congratulations and good wishes poured in from all over the world, there was conjecture as to where Mr. and Mrs. Armstrong Jones will honeymoon, in the Commonwealth or perhaps even in the United States, all eager to toast the handsome young storybook couple. They'd met at a private dinner party in 1958, and then something clicked from then on, you know, they... But there, as it grew into romance, it was and it remained a secret. Nobody, not even Lady Elizabeth Cavendish, who'd introduced them, none of her closest friends, none of her family, actually knew that they were going out with one another. And there, because nobody knew that she and Tony Armstrong Jones were seeing one another, when their engagement was announced, it really was a massive surprise. You know, the media was reeling, partly through enthusiasm and excitement, but he's a photographer, he's one of us. He worked in Fleet Street, he was a fashion designer, a fashion photographer, a society photographer, he was part of the, the press, you know, and they didn't know of, they had no idea that he even knew Princess Margaret. So there was this immense surprise. The public were absolutely delighted, of course, because at that time she was bigger than Diana. You know, she really was the people's princess and some. So that the fact that you know, to a lot of people, after, in inverted commas, not being allowed to marry Peter Townsend, now she was going to get married. Wedding day rehearsal of Princess Margaret and Anthony Armstrong Jones with lots of excitement in Britain. Public attention is focused on last minute preparations for the procession of the wedding couple from Westminster Abbey to Buckingham Palace. The city will be in festive array. Each flagpole along the mall adorned with triple crowns. The route of procession itself is carefully scouted out in an early morning dry run to check the timing of each sequence. No chance is being taken of an embarrassing mix-up or traffic jam. The Queen's coach heading the procession, the glass coach in which the bride and groom will ride, and the household cavalry riding as escort give Londoners a brief preview of the pageantry and splendor to come. Since the death of Margaret's father, King George VI, Prince Philip took the customary trip in the glass coach from Clarence House to Westminster Abbey with Princess Margaret. He walked her down the aisle and gave her away at the altar. She said to me that um... Prince Philip kept coming into her room and saying, if you don't hurry up, we're going to be late. As though her being the bride, it mattered whether or not she was going to be late. And um, she wore a hairpiece curled as a chignon inside the Portimore tiara that she was wearing. Um, she said, we're rather hoping that was going to stay on. Princess Margaret was an acclaimed beauty and one of the most fashionable women of the times, so the world was agog with speculation about her dress. When the dress was finally revealed on her wedding day, the world was quite surprised with the minimal design of the silk organza dress. It was described as the simplest royal wedding gown in history. Princess Margaret set a trend for more simple royal dresses with long-sleeved silhouettes. She would have been aware, naturally, of how much interest there was Britain went to town for the wedding, you know. It was the last time, I think, that the streets had been decorated in the way that they had. I mean, uh, the length of the mall was strung with white silk banners 
with the initials M and A on Tudor roses. Outside of Clarence House, where she lived, there was an immense arch of roses, real pink and red roses, some real, some artificial, you know, and this was replicated all the way to and from Westminster Abbey. So there was vast interest and excitement. You know, people camped out for days um, in the streets to, to, to watch the event. It also turned out to be the most magnificent May day, very sunny, very warm. And so it was, it was ideal, really. radiantly beautiful bride make their triumphal departure. A princess who rejected royalty and high society to find the man she loved. An artistic commoner of good family and highly successful freelance photographer. Mr. Armstrong Jones and his bride, Princess Margaret, Mrs. Anthony Armstrong Jones, ride to the palace to a tumultuous ovation from the fog. By the time of the arrival of the wedding party at Buckingham Palace, even the gracious and dignified Queen and Queen Mother reveal they share in the mood of jubilation that dominates the day. Bride and groom make their traditional appearance on the palace balcony to be cheered to the echo by one of the greatest crowds ever to mass in Britain in recent history. What she liked about it, one aspect that she liked about it too, was that, as she put it to me, that uh, she loved it that her friends could still watch the wedding because there were obviously, although there were 2,000 guests at Westminster Abbey, not everybody could be accommodated and there were friends of hers that for one reason or another couldn't, couldn't attend, but they could still see it on television and she absolutely loved that and it was also the first time that zoom lenses were used i think they cost about two thousand pounds at the time which is enormous money then she looked amazing we talked about the wedding dress which norman hartnell the doyen of fashion designers royal fashion designers um, and tony had said to her that it had to be absolutely plain. There mustn't be a bead or a pearl or a sequin, utterly plain, because the dress had to act as a foil to this magnificent tiara that she'd bought just at auction not long before. That is why her dress caused a sensation, because she was known for floaty evening gowns, lots of embroidery and so on. But this was utterly simple, and it did create a fashion sensation. Anthony was given the title Earl of Snowdon following their marriage. Can you, can you find the words to sum up how you feel today, both of you? Difficult to find mm. that sort of word, isn't it, really? Just delighted and, and happy. And I, I, I'm amazed that she's... Uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> yes. so. Well, it you obviously, means, your own interpretation, uh, obviously means two very happy people. Yes. Once well, again, congratulations. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much. Big I personally think that Diana fell in love with Prince Charles. It's obvious to me that she was a young, naive girl, and she fell in love with the prince. Now, if you watch that that piece of footage when Prince Charles is asked, are you in love, sir? Princess Diana's beaming and she's giggling, saying, yes, yes, yes. And he says, whatever love is. And she looks at him as if to say, what are you talking about? Don't you know what love is? That was the problem from the beginning. Charles didn't really know what love was.
One of the greatest weddings in royal history is that of Princess Charles to Lady Diana Spencer. Watched by a global audience of over 750 million people in over 70 countries. Lady Diana's choice of dressmaker was a break in tradition, with a choice of David and Elizabeth Emmanuel. Diana's wedding dress really is one for the ages. It is peak 80s extravagance and opulence, and it was a statement. It is arguably the most iconic wedding dress throughout history, or at least one of. The reason being, when she stepped out at St. Paul's Cathedral, all eyes were on her. She had these glorious, huge puff sleeves. She had ruffles down the front, a full skirt, sequins, 10,000 pearls, and a train that ran for 25 feet. It was designed by, at the time, husband and wife duo David and Elizabeth Emmanuel. And really interestingly, they didn't have a brief for it. So obviously for the designers, it was quite a momentous task to undertake. And the pressure for the designs not to be revealed was really quite high. As millions of people watched, the moment the world had been waiting for arrived. Diana exited the carriage to reveal her dress and it would go down as one of the most iconic royal wedding dresses in history. It transformed the shy, young Diana into a fairy tale princess, even if we all know that their ceremony wasn't quite the fairy tale that it seemed. In keeping with tradition, Charles and Diana's wedding rings were made from a nugget of Welsh gold. The tradition started by the Queen Mother in 1923 has seen every royal couple use Welsh gold in their rings. However, the couple did start a romantic tradition of their own. As the royal party made their way back to Buckingham Palace for the official portraits and the balcony appearance, Charles and Diana, after some persuasive encouragement from the excited crowd, gave us our first royal kiss. I, Diana Francis. I, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Philip Charles Arthur George. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto I give thee my troth. And thereto I give thee my troth. It was such a huge deal. It was the biggest royal wedding in decades, if not more, because the Queen had quite a, you know, a paired back wedding and it wasn't a televised affair, whereas this, everyone was going to watch. So what they did is they actually did a second wedding dress, which never really saw the light of day. It was very similar to it, but more paired back. They say it had a deeper V-neck and just fewer ruffles, fewer pearls, more understated. Although you don't really see Princess Diana's shoes in any of the pictures or the videos, they were designed by the Emmanuels as well and they were designed to match the dress, and they featured a lace, a few pearls, had a heart on the toe, and really there was a lovely little romantic detail to them because Princess Diana was rather romantic, so she had C and D designed under the sole of the shoe. So you didn't see it, but obviously she knew it was there and it was a sweet nod to her husband-to-be. Really interestingly, it said that after her divorce, Princess Diana didn't want to wear any Chanel logo items because it was the, the interlocked two Cs, so it's thought she thought it was too much of a reminder of Prince Charles and Camilla. I remember the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spence very well because I was at Buckingham Palace. At the end of a very long red carpeted corridor, I noticed this ball of white racing towards me, and I realized it was Princess Diana. She'd rolled her train up into a ball, tucked it under her arm. She had her slippers in one hand, and she was racing down this corridor. She says, but you know, the most wonderful thing was walking down the aisle of St. Paul's Cathedral with my father. She says, but did you ever look at the footage of that? She says, next time you look at it, watch me. She says, can't you see me looking from side to side? Can you see me doing that? Do you know what I'm doing? I'm looking for her. I'm looking for Camilla. And she was there. She was even at my wedding. So this spectre of Camilla was always there in the princess's life. 
I think Diana uh, had terrible jitters on her wedding day. In fact, the night before, she, she'd wanted to get out of the whole thing. And she'd had a sort of funny, jokey evening with her sisters. And they said, you can't get out of it now. Your face is on the tea towels. And that made her laugh. But she discovered about Camilla. She discovered that Charles was giving her gifts. And she didn't know the half of it, but she knew that Camilla was a very important person in her fiance's life. And she, be she said she became obsessed, ab absolutely obsessed, so that when she was walking down the aisle, she spotted Camilla in the, in the congregation. But she said what sort of helped her at that moment was concentrating on her father, because he just had a stroke, and she was really, and he's a very big man, and she was really guiding her father. I was busy working at Highgrove, a phone went. One of my colleagues got the phone and he said, oh, there's a phone call for you. And it was um, one of the prince's top aides, one of his top aides. And he said, I've, I've been asked to phone you by the Prince of Wales and the Dutch of Cornwall. He says, because they would like to personally invite you to their wedding. Because as a member of staff, you haven't completed the amount of time, but they're sending you a private invitation. I remember that as if it was yesterday. I remember exactly where the, the call took place. I remember my thoughts. I remember the phone. I remember everything. I remember I was trying not to get upset because I was so emotional and like excited about this. And it was unbelievable. I mean, it was amazing because suddenly there I am as a guest of the Prince of Wales in Dacomo and with all the celeb friends, with other royals, um, VIPs, dignitaries, prime ministers, and I'm there as a guest. The prince's second wedding was not quite such a grand affair. He and Camilla Parker Bowles married in a small civil ceremony at Windsor Guildhall. Uniquely, the Queen did not attend the ceremony but did attend the church blessing and reception afterwards. Camilla chose two dresses, one a cream silk chiffon and the other a pale blue floor length gown with a coach dress. I'm delighted for the Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles. It's very happy news and when the cabinet heard it this morning, they sent congratulations and good wishes on behalf of the whole government. So I remember one morning the television was on in the other room and suddenly we had breaking news and it said the Prince of Wales has announced his engagement and we worked for him but we didn't know <laughs> we didn't know they've waited long enough but tonight they emerged as a couple soon to be wed If you've been together this long, you've perhaps a right to demand a ring worth waiting for. And in this regard, the royal family doesn't disappoint. Camilla sported a whopping diamond upon her finger, and she was clearly on a high. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much indeed. How are you feeling, ma'am? Um, all right. Just all right. I'm just, about, I'm just coming down to work. Did he get down on one knee to propose? I think in the early days, in fairness to her, I think it was obviously slightly nerve-wracking as well because she was marrying into the family. She obviously knew the family very well, but suddenly she was marrying into the family and was going to become, well, one of the, the most senior members of the royal family. So I think there was quite a bit of pressure for her, but she's never, in all the years I was there, she never changed. She was always the same. Your Royal Highness, uh, mm -hmm. eight days now to the wedding. Can I ask you how you are you, feeling? Heard how in particular <laughs> Princes William and Harry are feeling mm. at the prospect of the marriage? Very happy. Very pleased. Be a good day. Prince William, can I just ask you, are you looking forward to being a witness? Yes, very much so, definitely. As long as I don't lose the rings, I'm all right. Yeah. The one responsibility, I'm bound to do something wrong. No, she is... Um, She's, she's a wonderful woman, and she's made our father very, very happy, which is the most important thing. William and I love her to bits, 
get on really well with her. Um, and as far as I see it, nothing's changed. I'm not around that much. I'm at Sandhurst. William's just finished university. Now he's doing a bit of work here and there. So um, we're not around that much anyway. But when we are around, everyone's happy, everyone's fine, you know. Well, of course, it's absolutely wonderful news. And all of us, the whole family, are delighted. Uh, I don't think one wants to say much more than that, but I'm very happy to reiterate this. Hmm? I think in the Duchess of Cornwall that Prince Charles sees she's his soulmate, she's his best friend. And I think that's face face. I don't think that's one way. I think they both see that in each other. And, you know, when you see them together and them interacting and, and, you know, also just the way they kind of look at each other and they're on the same wavelength. You know, they're even speaking, they're on the same wavelength. And you can tell, you can just, you know, you can just see that between them. And I think that's something really, really special. I think the Queen and Prince Philip had it. I think Prince Charles and Camilla has, have got it. I think William and Kate have got it. And they're really lucky. They're really lucky that they've got that, that royal connection. She had a lot of ingredients that Charles really, really fell in love with, and he never really fell out of love with her. So it is, it is a very romantic story. Well, it's the most brilliant news. Um, I'm, I'm just so happy for both of them. They are so happy, and it, it's wicked. So maybe we just ask your reaction to the wedding, please, sir. Obviously, obviously it's thrilled. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Practicing for long enough. As you know, Catherine and Prince William have been going out together for quite a number of years. We all think he's wonderful and we're extremely fond of him. We wish them every happiness for the future. <laughs> and you produced a ring? Yeah. There and then? I did, yeah. I'd been carrying it around with me in my rucksack for about three weeks before that. And uh, I literally would not let it go. Everywhere I went, I was keeping hold of it because I knew this thing, if it disappeared, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, and, yeah, because I planned it, it sort of, it went fine as, you know, you'll hear a lot of horror stories about proposing and things go horribly wrong. But it went really, really well and, uh, yeah, I was really pleased that she said yes. I took her up somewhere nice in, uh, in Kenya and, uh, and proposed. It's very romantic. There's a true romantic in that. There is. <laughs> One of the greatest events of the 21st century was the wedding of Prince William to Catherine Middleton, which was celebrated as a modern day fairy tale, although the couple stayed true to many of the long standing royal tradition. One delightful aspect of the engagement was that Prince William gave Kate the ring his mother had been given by Prince Charles at the time of their engagement. It was very telling that he chose to give Kate Middleton his mother's engagement ring, and he said, I want my mother to be part of this, to be present. The marriage, the ceremony, the wedding, just actually puts a seal on what everybody has been aware of for a long, long time. To my mind, I think the basis of the relationship is respect. She has never been a dog's body or a doormat. She's always fought her corner uh, somebody said to her, aren't you very fortunate to be going out with Prince William? And she said, no, he's very lucky to be going out with me. I have with me Paddy Harverson, who is communication secretary at Clarence House, who's the man absolutely at the centre of these last <laughs> few months of preparations and planning. How are you feeling today? How's very it Very excited, yeah, and relaxed. I think the planning's gone well. We're all here, the crowds are here, the weather's holding on, so it's fantastic. And tell me about the Prince. How's he doing this morning? He's great. I mean, you know, uh, he's, having, he's had breakfast with his brother and their friends, and uh, I was with him last night. We were in the press office at Clarence House, and he rang up, said, I want to go outside and meet the crowd. So we all piled out, and it was just fantastic, a lovely, spontaneous thing. He wanted to go and say thank you to everyone for, for coming along and queuing up overnight. So he's in great form. It's a really exciting atmosphere here. I think people are very proud to be English. You're seeing a lot of nationalism, a lot of Union Jacks displayed everywhere. And of course, the large contingent of Americans and people from all over the world who have come to celebrate this very, very special couple.
This is when the English, the British, come to their own. We have all the equipment. We have the household cavalry. We have the wonderful carriages. We have those ancient Rolls Royces. And there's a great spirit here, a spirit I think you could say was evocative of 1981 and the wedding of Prince William's parents, Charles and Diana. There's a real enthusiasm for it. As the British public filled the streets of London to share this historical event, the ceremony boasted a star-studded liner. As Prince William made his way to Westminster Abbey, he was no doubt lifted by thousands of cheering bystanders, greeting and supporting one of the future kings of England. The biggest decision for any bride is her dress, and the public was desperate to find out what Kate would wear. Her choice, a dress designed by Sarah Burton, remained a very closely guarded secret until the big day. And there's a veil, and there is Kate Middleton. We can see that the train of the dress helped into the rear of the vehicle, lace surrounding Kate Middleton's neck and the veil. A great view there of the proud father, Mike Middleton, as he adjusts his jacket, a That's reassuring pat on the arm for his daughter. Lily of the Valley on, uh, on his lapel. She is wearing brand Alexander McQueen. It is a wedding dress that has been designed, as was speculated, by Sarah Burton. So if you imagined a fairy tale princess and her dress, is that the picture you had in your mind? I think perhaps it might have been. It is the sight, after all these months of build-up and speculation, that many have been longing for. And she's taking a moment to give the crowd a wave. The team have said that the dress epitomises timeless British craftsmanship by drawing together talented and skilled workmanship from across the United Kingdom. The dress was of ivory satin with a boned bodice and the hips padded, with a full skirt and modest train. The lace was handiworked using a traditional Irish technique by members of the Royal School of Needlework, and it had flowers from all over the United Kingdom, from shamrocks to roses. What my opinion of the dress was that it was uh, youthfully regal. It was modern with a classic twist to it, which was fantastic because I didn't want Kate to sort of lose touch of Kate in the whole pageantry of this occasion. And I think uh, Sarah Burton for Alexander McQueen did a sublime job. I think the, the lace was so effortlessly executed. It was almost as if she had like a white tattoo all the way down her arm and the fine buttons and then you saw that quintessential McQueen detail on the rough of the spine. I thought the skirt was just enough skirt for a venue like the Abbey. I, I think you know to have something slimmer with a long train she might not have filled that space with the with the sort of um, ease as she did with this dress. But I thought she looked very, very beautiful, very exquisite, seriously polished. Holding her veil in place, Catherine wore the diamond halo tiara, which had been lent to her by Queen Elizabeth II. A bride's bouquet is an important part of the wedding. Catherine followed tradition of having a sprig of myrtle taken from Osborne House, originally planted by Queen Victoria, and representing love, fertility, and innocence, as well as including lily of the valley and hyacinths the addition of Sweet William was made, a nod to her husband.
Okay, Catherine, you're let's go. Take thee, William Arthur Philip Louis. Take thee, William Arthur Philip Louis. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto I give thee my truth. And thereto I give thee my truth. Amen. Amen. The ceremony was a truly joyous event. On leaving Westminster Abbey, Kate laid her bouquet on the Tomb of the Unknown Warrior, a tradition stemming from the Queen Mother in 1923, as she laid her bouquet in memory of her brother Fergus, who had died during World War I. As a couple who value tradition, the Duke and Duchess had a multi-tiered, beautiful fruitcake, carefully crafted by Fiona Cairns. It is a custom for attendees of the wedding to be sent a slice of the wedding cake in the post following the big day, and is just one reason why fruitcake is the cake of choice due to its density and shelf life. But the groom also insisted on a chocolate biscuit cake being served, a childhood favorite. It contained 35 pounds of chocolate and 1,700 tea biscuits. Prince William looked fantastic in that sort of royals and blue red uniform, very unusual, matched the red of that carpet that went up the centre of Westminster Abbey. He looked marvellous and the white gloves when he was waving at the crowds, he looked the dashing prince. I thought William's choice of, of the red was fantastic. I mean, Kate's heart must have gone pitter-patter completely when she saw her prince standing there. And I caught that glimpse of Harry when he took, a, a, he took a, a sideward glance at seeing Kate while William turned the other way, and he said to his brother, she's beautiful. And that was really, really charming between the two boys. Um, you know, how wonderful was that? You know, what got me was I looked at the father you know, Mr. Middleton, and I thought to myself, you know, all those many years ago, he had a little girl. And look what happens, you know, how, you know, the twists and turns of life. William and Kate's royal marriage still thrives to this day. And they are now one of the world's most respected and famous couples. To see some movement there behind those curtains, and here we go. Oh, wow, she says. Oh, oh wow. wow. <laughs> That was the kiss that everybody wanted. And there was no prompting or persuasion needed. No. <laughs> As Buckingham Palace was surrounded by thousands of cheering onlookers, they finally got to witness the first public kiss between Prince William and Kate Middleton. The extraordinary event was viewed by billions of people around the world. I, William Arthur Philip Louis, take thee, Catherine Elizabeth, to my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. It's a standard, typical night it's for us. It's a cosy night. It was what we're doing, just roasting chicken roasting and having... Roasting chicken, <laughs> trying to roast chicken. <laughs> trying to roast the chicken. And it was just, a, uh, just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. He got on one knee. Of course. Was it an instant yes from you? 
Yes, as a matter of fact, I could barely let you finish proposing. I was like, can I say yes now? She didn't even let me finish. She said, can I say yes, can I say yes now? And then, then there was hugs and I had the ring in my finger. And I was like, can I, can I give you the ring? And she goes, oh, yes, the ring. <laughs> so no, it was, um, it was a really nice moment. It was just the two of us. And Prince Harry chose an American girl, Meghan Markle, to be his princess. Their wedding at Windsor Castle caught the attention of millions of people across the globe and brought Britain and America together. Meghan's dress had a timeless elegance reminiscent of Princess Margaret's dress. However, her veil was delicately edged with flora from each Commonwealth country and held in place with Queen Mary's bandeau tire made in 1932. Although the dress was very simple in terms of design, there were no beads, there was no lace, the train was magnificent. It was something like 30 feet long. It had roses from every place in the Commonwealth. It was absolutely thoughtfully and beautifully done. Megan was a spectacular bride, which is what we expected her to be. But what was also interesting to me was she was not interested in flash. She was not interested in upstaging anybody. She was very simple, elegant, and tasteful. Uh, this was a very glamorous woman who knows that she knows how to pull off a dress like that. Megan was absolutely glamorous, radiant, and beautiful, no less than we expected from a Hollywood star. Quite touchingly, as Megan's father could not attend the ceremony, Meghan walked the first portion of the aisle alone, and Prince Charles walked with her for the rest of it. Also a particularly touching moment when Megan first walked down the aisle to Harry, he looked at her and he said, hi. 
And then he said, you look amazing. So for those of us romantics, it brought quite a tear to our eyes to see this couple that's very obviously madly in love uh, see each other at the altar for the very first time. Whilst we didn't get the romantic balcony kiss on Buckingham Palace, the couple did share a kiss on the steps of the chapel as they left. Harry and Meghan decided against the fruitcake tradition for the all-important wedding cake, instead opting for a lemon elderflower cake made by Claire Patak of London's Violet Bakery. America is over the moon because it feels like we finally got our own real life princess. And I would say what stood out to me was William seemed far more nervous than Harry did. Harry was far more emotional than William. We had saw a lot more tears from Harry. I don't I didn't remember seeing any from William on the day. But in both cases, the brides appeared to be less nervous and more strong than the grooms, which I thought was very touching and romantic. Um, both William and Kate and Meghan and Harry appear to be two couples who are very much mad in love with each other and far from the days in royals past where things were arranged and things were loveless in both young couples today we see a great strong bond of romance love and affection i think it's a really interesting time for the royal family and i think this marriage sort of cements a transition that's been happening for a while with the monarchy modernizing and moving with the times if you look back to you know 30 years ago even Divorce was such taboo, it's no longer a taboo. Our next king and queen again are both divorced. So the fact that Harry is now able to marry someone who's been, who's been divorced isn't an issue, is a great thing. She's mixed race. That would have been an issue probably years ago. It isn't anymore. It's great. It means that Harry's wife is going to be much more reflective of society in general than the sort of blue blooded people who've married into the royal family previously. So I think it's a brilliant thing. But above all of that, they're clearly in love, so that's a, you know all the other things are just a bonus in helping to show a much more modern, relevant monarchy. Making the beginning of the happily ever after, Harry and Meghan's wedding will be remembered in history as one of the most spectacular royal events of all times. There's nothing quite like a royal wedding. Lavish ceremonies, glass carriages, ethereal cakes, prancing horses, yards long wedding trains, diamond tiaras, botanical traditions, and thousands of cheering people. It's always a big occasion that brings a whole country into a flurry of excitement and fascination. Through the years, Wedding day styles and traditions evolved, and by establishing a connection with the people, they all influence the way we say, I do, today. And grant that he who gives it, and she who shall wear it, may remain faithful to each other, and abide in thy peace and favour, and live together in love until their lives end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord.